cooperation. As I bring up one of the, uh, the stream. The only one that matters is Twitch. Ah, uh, Hellboy's playing Fortnite. Ugh. Ah, uh, that's terrible. Is he playing that on my stream? Mm-hmm. Ugh. You're supporting Fortnite. Listen, I don't support anything. Okay. Tangentially supporting it. I, I guess. <laughs> oh man, I was so thin. My hair was so long back when we did these videos. Same to both of those. <laughs> K Kenneth was so thin and his hair was so long back then. Uh, uh, what it would be like to be a year <laughs> younger and more in shape. <laughs> 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 That was also before things. I blame Dallas. That was well. Oh, what, that wasn't even. Was that before things started getting bad? No, things were getting bad at the time we recorded this. Mm. There was. They were going. This. That was a part of the slow downturn that abruptly mm. hit a wall and became a hard downturn. We're fucking assholes. It's okay. It's the same thing going on here at TI now. It was a nice gradual slow downturn, and now it's just a massive. Fuck you to the face, and where is she going? Mm -hmm. Well, if you got work for Lockheed, I can assure you... It's gonna be... That yeah. probably won't happen. What won't? The downturn? Speaking of, hello, ladies and gentlemen! It's your host, Top Brother Score One, also known as David, with my co-host over here. Raining Death 99, also known as Kenneth. And welcome to episode 93 of Table Talk Thursday. You know, we're pretty close to 100. In about seven more weeks, we'll be at episode 100. Now, we could have said we went for 100 straight weeks, but ever since we moved to Dallas, as we were just talking about live, we became fat <laughs> and lazy. <laughs> Essentially. And apparently got our hair cut shorter. Well, except for me. Well, yeah, my hair is still shorter now. <clears throat> yeah. It does suck. Anyway, whatever. It's cool. Anyways, starting off at the top of the hour, we have Julian Assange. Yes, some of the biggest Wiggly's news. Besides the black hole. Arrested in London. Besides the black hole. Because the black hole is just power. fucking memes everywhere. Jesus, fuck the memes. I know. Goddamn. So many memes. Yep. So many black holes. Pretty sure it's on here. There we go. It is here. It's on our list. It's there. It's definitely on the list. Yep. Black hole but memes. But yes, Julian Assange. Wikileak co-founder, who has been holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy for the last seven years to avoid extradition to Sweden over a sexual assault case that has since been dropped, has been captured. He now faces U.S. federal conspiracy charges related to one of the largest ever leaks of government secrets. The UK will decide whether to extradite Assange in response to allegations by the Department of Justice. They're probably going to yes. extradite him. As soon as I saw that he got captured by them, I was like, he's fucked. Because, you know, no, yeah, he Interpol's going to He was absolutely him correct up. that that Sweden sexual assault case was definitely... I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty solidly believing that that Sweden sexual assault case was for extradition purposes. So, wait, what, so did you say there was a sexual assault case that came up? Yeah, so in 2012, the reason why he went to the Ecuadorian embassy was in 2012, he was accused of sexual assault in Sweden, mm -hmm. and the charges were rather unsubstantiated. Mm -hmm. um, so he needed asylum, which Ecuador gave him, mm -hmm. and then he held up in the asylum, in the uh, embassy, waiting to be moved out. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the total plan was not to keep him there in the embassy. He was eventually supposed to be moved to Ecuador. But he stayed there for how many years? Did he stay there? Seven. Yeah. He's been there <coughs> for seven years. Yeah. Man's been there for quite a while. We haven't been running the show for that long, but I already knew about Assange no. forever ago. Yeah. I mean, his name came to prominence in the during the whole uh, leaks. Of, WikiLeaks in general. Know, stuff. Well, WikiLeaks in general came to head in 2012. Whenever the diplomatic cables were released by Bradley Manning, who is now Chelsea Manning. Mm. And then, of course, it gained further prominence with the documents released by Edward Snowden 
talking about the massive uh, United States spying program on all of its citizens and pretty much everyone everywhere at any point in time since its existence. Yeah, which I, I still don't know wh why we didn't know that. We knew that that was going on because we we yeah, we I mean, let we... Bush do that be as a part of nine eleven. So like whenever everyone's like, oh my god, it's like guys, seriously. Uh, th some of the, e even though some of them were crazy conspiracy nuts were telling you at the time, like they weren't wrong that this is what it allows them to do. This is what this opens up, and they will be actually spying. And they told us they would be spying on us, but they said, you know, they tried to say it would well, be a, is, more like the particular. The Constitution is supposed to protect us from this because it was <laughs> unwarranted spying of United States citizens. But it didn't because yeah, have, it was an executive order. Executive orders. It doesn't matter. Executive orders aren't aren't exempt from the law, from the constitution. So the the patriot the, pa the patriot act was like a a a ability for them to do that under the pretense of national security. Yeah, but that's where a lot of the stuff extent, came from. It gave them some. It gave them some of this power, but not to the extent that they went to. Yeah. Sure. Did they have the power to spy on American people? Yes. Did they have the legal right under the Patriot Act for some circumstances? Yes. They could have said it, Did yes, they? but still. It... Did the FISA court give them the power and the legal fucking black hole of protection and rubber stamping this of that court to spy on all American citizens? Yes. Did what, is what they did illegal? Yes. It, well, not illegal, but it is unconstitutional for sure. Right. <clears throat> but if, but it's, then, but they'll just tell that it was for the good of you. You don't know what's best for it you. It doesn't matter. It was for the good of us. Yeah. Right. You know. There was such. There still. There was, and there still is so much darkness hovering over the damn FISA court. Because that's where they went. The FISA court was the sole court to basically determine we need a warrant for X, Y, and Z under the Patriot Act or under whatever. And we didn't want anybody to find out. FISA court, rubber stamp. They approved like 95, 98% of the shit that went to the FISA court got approved. Right. Hmm. I mean, there was nothing to stop them. Anyways, back to this. Uh, Julian Assange is facing up to five years in U.S. prison if convicted on the charges of conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. So Assange's lawyer said that they would be fighting any extradition request, and they said, and uh, she says it sets a dangerous precedent where any journalist could face U.S. charges for publishing truthful information about the United States. The thing is, journalists do have protections. Uh, I mean, there's there's whistleblower protections for sure, of which, if America wasn't, if the American justice system and the politicians weren't so hell-bent on protecting themselves and instead were focused on protecting the citizens they were elected to represent, then this might not be as big of a problem. So the, the, the only reason why he, like, loses his... Uh, is it, it... This is also one of those, like, Bill of Rights, uh, rights, amendment rights, you know, constitutional rights for, of the freedom of press. It says, uh, isn't, isn't that protected with the first... Uh, yes. So, there's that, but it's because he, it's because he did the, the, the bad thing of giving, you know, away state secrets, basically, or, you know, whistleblowing. So, but it's okay to whistleblow on everybody else to the government, but it's not okay to whistleblow about the government. That's what this is, mm -hmm. that's the precedent well, here. that's the thing, is that the First <laughs> Amendment, um... It's supposed to be freedom of press and it's supposed to be, it's freedom information of press. and stuff but in general. Includes to publish things the United States does not like, yeah. like the yeah. WikiLeaks documents, that is a protected ability. Because all, because the what the what the press is called they're called the fourth estate. So you know we have the three branches of government. Well, the press is supposed to be the fourth estate. They're supposed to be the watchmen of the government. They're supposed to be there to report when the government does bad things. Yeah, and for years. I mean that's how the Watergate the stuff has... got big. That's how that's how everything has been like come basically come to light every time something's happened and it's been you know yeah. our government's been there. But for years the government has tried to crack down on the fourth. They tried to censor them. They tried to shut them down. 
I mean, Trump talks about it all the time. It's like whenever he was on the campaign, it was like, we're going to get rid of their licenses and we're going to tax them. We're going to charge them with libel or slander or whatever else, all this bullshit. He's trying, him specifically, is quite vehemently attempting to attack the press and is attempting to, he's called the press the enemy of the people. If that's not an attack on freedom of speech and expression and the freedom of the press, I don't know what is. Right. And on top of that, that's very bad. That opens the door to uh, just pl- fascism, plain and simple. Basically, everything that happens all basically to the rest of the world, you know, Americans think we're so free, they've been slowly re- eroding our freedoms, you know, yearly. I mean, it's like that quote from Thomas Jefferson. If you, if you give up freedom and uh, liberty for security, you shall have neither. Yep. It's as simple as that, folks. Uh, we've given up our freedoms, we've given up our security because the Patriot Act and its broad well, So the Patriot Act effects. died years ago, thankfully. Like, it finally... No, 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 re- the Patriot Act keeps getting extended. I thought it actually... I thought it finally was not extended. I thought the Patriot Act finally died. No, uh, some measures of it did get extended. Not all of it. But I think, like, the main provisions for spying, I believe, got extended. Let me see. Why did it give me the fucking History Channel? Uh Oh, it did bring me the History Channel. History Topics 21st Century Patriot Act. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. U.S. Patriot Act. Department of Justice. This is an attack on the press. Now, the thing is, like, how other journalists get away with it. Like, what... Um, what's his name? Big famous person of The Guardian who published the documents from Edward Snowden. His name escapes me. I can see it. He started The Intercept. I know that. The thing is, like, a lot of uh, press outlets are supposed to review the document to make sure it doesn't have anything uh, that could endanger lives and such. Mm -hmm. And then responsibly publish it, you know, censoring information that could harm people. That, That is a responsibility of a press because it's 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 the correct thing to do obviously if information got out that harmed uh you know u.s citizens or people in special you know, spies and whatnot it would be very bad <laughs> so press generally try and censor documentation information they also try and communicate with the actual government themselves and saying, hey, we have this documentation. We are going to publish it, but we just want you to go through it and vet it, essentially. So it looks like the only thing that expires at the end of this year is... Um, roving Surveillance Authority under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. That's 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 the one that hasn't that's one that hasn't been um, oh, yeah no one that hasn't been uh, expired everything else has expired all the sections of it have expired other than that even though they show they're all in the, I don't know for in Wikipedia the fucking check marks on the status of all of them exist one was just X'd. access records and other items of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that one's dead. I guess they extended it. Interesting. So let's see, according to this, he has, uh, Julian Assange has pleaded not guilty to the 2012 charges of failing to surrender to the court. Uh, Finding him guilty of that charge, District Judge Michael Snow said Assange's behavior was the, excuse me, the behavior of a narcissist who cannot get beyond his own selfish interest. He was sent to Southwark Crown Court for sentencing where he faces up to 12 months in prison. The court also heard during his arrest at the embassy that he had to be restrained and shouted, This is unlawful, I am not leaving. So, in, so to give backstory again about why uh, the U.S. government wants to extradite, Assange, is that he set up WikiLeaks in 2006 with the aims of obtaining and publishing excuse me, confidential documents and images um, with the organization's headlines four years later where it released U.S. footage, uh, footage of U.S. soldiers killing civilians from a helicopter in Iraq 
banned journalists from uh, Reuters, I believe. Uh, and then in 2010, when uh, former U.S. intelligence agent uh, analyst Chelsea Manning was arrested for publishing the 700,000 confidential documents, videos, and diplomatic cables. So, yes. Um, this is uh, interesting to see. We'll see what happens from here. I do expect he will be getting extradited. I'm imagining the U.S. has probably already sent the extradition request uh, for these charges. And I don't think the U.K. will do anything to stop them. So it's basically just going to be the huge fight between the United States government and his lawyers. And the government will most likely win. He will get extradited, have a quick, quick uh, trial, and then will disappear for the rest of his life. Anyway. Yep. Well, interesting. Just reading up into the yeah. Patriot Act stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, skip the next story. No, you don't want to do the Saudi Prince thing. No. All right. Okay. All right. Bah. Homo Luzon Luzonessis, uh, I guess. Uh, Lu yeah, yeah Luzonessis. Uh, yeah, Nessis, like Genesis. Anyway, it's Homo Luzo Nenesis. Luzon Nenesis? Yeah, I don't know. The human species found in the Philippines. So there's a new addition to the family tree an extinct species of human that's been found in the Philippines. Um, after the site discovery, so it was named after the site discovery on the country's largest island, Luzon. Its physical features are a mixture of those found in very ancient human ancestors and in more recent people. So, like, the, the closer to us link, I would say, or somewhere in the middle. Yeah. It's pretty interesting, because they said that the, the finger and toe bones were curved, suggesting that climbing was still an important act for this species. Yes. Um, yep. <clears throat> Let's see. So, uh, it's physical features. Yeah, so this could mean the primitive human relative left Africa and made it all the way to Southeast Asia, something not previously thought possible. I mean, shit. I can't think about how they made it across, you know, from where they thought they were going to India all the way to America, you know, on a fucking sailboat, essentially. What? No, they made it over the land bridge. Unless you're talking about... No, 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 I'm talking about how Columbus, how Columbus fucking magically made it, you know, across the world. But originally, this okay. th this stuff was all, like you say, one giant landmass. There wasn't a, really a land bridge. Everything was all one piece at some point. I'm not sure where the hell you are in history, mate. <clears throat> well, no, because I, I was talking about, like, you know, they were trying to understand how people got there, and I was like, well, you know, realistically, we've gotten across the world many well, times over. We know how they got there. There was the land bridge between Russia and well what was what is Russia and Alaska during the one of the ends of the ice age. Mm -hmm. People crossed the bridge. The bridge then melted away and then those people populated North America and South America. Right. Easy. But what Because that would have been the only really feasible way for them to get here. <clears throat> I mean, I suppose. Could, could 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 have floated on something. Who knows? Yes. I mean, floated across the Pacific. It should exist. I mean, you know, things exist in the water. They could have known what fishing was at the time. Shit. It's not. It's not necessarily unfeasible. They could have not made it across. In the eighteen, in the in like the freaking sixteen hundreds, when people had proper ships and supplies and all this other shit, they still had trouble getting across the goddamn. Atlantic. Yeah. To here, let alone crossing the Pacific. Well, that's what I was saying. They were, they were, they had trouble getting, you know, getting across the Atlantic, but they did, you know, they still managed. And a lot of ships didn't make it. Yeah. So you expect? So you're trying to say some? It's possible some humans fucking did it. Were able to make a ship and sail across the Pacific. I mean, if if no. we take a moment and look at the pyramids and how they were constructed, it took lots of effort and it was like an engineering marvel. At the time, especially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we know how they were. But what I'm saying is that it's still possible that now, these people did that something. Wasn't freaking hundreds of thousands of years ago. 
the other thing is we don't even know about history that far ago, other than the fact that the land bridge yeah, existed. We, we had a pretty good idea. I, and also on top of that, I think depending on where this was at, in time, uh, no, I guess it. I guess it was only a small section of time. I guess it wasn't whenever everything was still one giant landmass. Anyway. You talking about Pangea? Yeah. Pangea. There weren't dinosaurs. I mean, Pangea. Pangea was hundreds of millions of years ago. Was it hundreds of millions? Hundreds of millions. All right. Humans weren't anywhere near Pangea. <laughs> you went from dinosaurs to humans. I, I... So yeah, Pangea began. Uh, to break apart roughly 175 million years ago. It was assembled from earlier continental units approximately 335 million years ago. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. Anyway. The new specimens from Kahlo Cave in the north of Luzon are described in the journal Nature. They have been dated between to be between 67,000 years and 50,000 years ago. They consist of 13 remains, teeth, hand, and foot bones, as well as part of a femur that belonged to at least three adult and juvenile individuals. What? Oh, I guess parts of femurs that can... I was like, one femur? That it belonged it's to three femurs? Femur. I was like, hold on. They just took it out and shared it amongst each other. So I was like, what? They have been recovered in excavations to the cave since 2007. Uh, Homo luzonensis has become has some physical similarities to recent humans, but in other features, hark back to the austral austral pithecines. Is that it? Yeah, because that's correct. Upright walking ape-like uh, uh, creatures that lived in Africa between two and four million years ago, as well as uh, very early members of genius Homo, which is us. Okay, I didn't see where you were. Yep. Yes, Australopithecus. Uh, yeah, Australopithecus. And as as Kenneth had said, their bones, fingers, and toes are curved, suggesting climbing is still an important activity for the species. This also seems to be the case for some Austro Australopithecines. Yep, interesting indeed. I mean, they're in a cave, so me. And I mean, it, I mean, it was. I mean, in, uh, in the Philippines itself is pretty heavily forested. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess it makes sense. I mean, when your best way to get around is trees or yep. <clears throat> climbing for rocks or whatever. So, if there were, if species like that were able to reach Southeast Asia, Asia, it would change the way our ideas uh, about who on our human family tree left Africa first. Homo erectus has long thought to have been the first member of our direct line to leave uh, the African homeland around 1.9 million years ago. And given that Luzon was only ever accessible by sea, the find raises questions about how pre-human species might have reached the island. I mean, by boat? Or maybe there was weird underground fucking cave systems these people lived in them. Well, when these people came about, I mean, when was the problem? In addition to Homo Luzonesius, Luzonesi, uh, island southeast Asia also appears to have been home to another human species called Denisovians, who appear to have inbred with early modern humans, Homo sapiens, uh, when they arrived in the region. So, regular people existed, and then they inbred with them, which... What? I mean, we have, we have I mean, yeah, Homo sapiens, we, as a species, just outbreed everything else. Technically, we're all on some level or another inbred. At some point, at some point down the line, eh? But hey, Maybe. that's that's how that's how life works. <laughs> anyway, I mean, if you go back far enough, I suppose. Yep. Uh, the evidence comes. What is it? Oh, it comes from analysis of DNA, and no known Denisovian fossils have been found in the region. Ah. Uh, the Indonesian island of Flores was home to a species called Homo florensis, which is because of Flores, nicknamed the Hobbits because of their small stature. They're the Hobbits! They are thought to have survived there from at least 100,000 years ago until 50,000 years ago. Wow. Potentially overlapping with the arrival of modern humans. Interesting. So, you know, we all talk about D&D, &D, but D&D &D was the time that we all actually lived at some point. <laughs> There were real humans during the D&D &D times. <laughs> uh. 
When were the D and D times? I don't know. When early human times? When there were still other creatures about? Te- technically, <laughs> right. would be the D and D times. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but this is pretty interesting. I mean, another fossil. Agreed. Another fossil. Mm. Another chunk of human history that you know existed. Mm-hmm. Homo sapiens have been around for the past 300,000 years. Hold on, I see a fucking, like, a goddamn ad article. Man, quote, shopless after buying an $8 million island. What? (laughs) Elsewhere on BBC. I just thought that was Um, funny. Yeah, I think he, like, stole millions of dollars and then bought an island and then was cut. Is that what it was? I believe so. How do you steal that much money? Oh, no, a Florida man. <laughs> That's all you had to Florida say. Man. Has arrested after shoplifting in a supermarket. So, yeah, shoplifting in a supermarket uh, shortly after he bought a multi-million dollar private island. He is accused of stealing about $300 worth of household goods after he made an $8 million fucking buy. Another dangerous what? He, oh, he denied the allegation and blamed it on a, quote, commercial dispute. Interesting. Yeah. Anyways. Continuing on to Brexit. So, it happened, folks. Not Brexit, but it got extended again. (laughs) Yeah, of course Brexit didn't happen. Brexit's not going to happen. And May acknowledges the huge frustration as she accepts yet another Brexit delay. So Brexit has now been delayed to October 31st, which will not be enough time because the UK will never fucking leave the goddamn European Union. I mean, just all this fucking shit, just so many... Failed agreements, historically bad, failed votes, votes of no confidence. I mean, Teresa and everybody else should just just stop it. Just just stop it. Just do some change from the inside of the EU and just get over it. Because Brexit is never going to happen. But you're going to keep getting extensions. They're until... never going to leave the EU. Until the EU just finally goes, all right, we're about enough, fuck you. Just cuts it off completely. Yeah. I mean, they could. They didn't have to extend it. They could have just said, we're not extending it. Boom. Hard Brexit. Done. Right. The hardest Brexit. You you have now Brexited. And then as their economy and like everything goes into shambles, they're like, ah, oh, yes. Would you like to join the our Lord and Savior, the EU? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, speaking of which, oh my god, we keep having fucking like Christian people coming by our fucking house, like, people run around our neighborhood and, like, try to fucking hand out, like, little things, and this is the second week in a row, I'm pretty sure, there was, like, a couple of younger girls that came by earlier, and I think they were doing the same thing, we just didn't answer the door, and then these two older dudes came by, and we answered the door, and they're like, hey, so, we're Christian, and, like, <clears throat> we'd like to pray for you, is that okay? And we're like, they like Jehovah Witnesses? No, they were Christian. They're like, yeah. They were like, hey, this dude's like, hey, I'm a Christian. He's like, yeah, you know, this guy lives down, down by Colorado. This guy lives here in McKinney. And they're like, yeah, where are your neighbors here in McKinney? And I was like, that's cool. And they're just like, yeah. It's supposed to say it's saying trespassers will be shot. Right? And, and it's just. <laughs> and it's. Also solicitors. It's just ridiculous. And, like, they're like, yeah, I want to pray for you. And Michelle's like, well, I'm Buddhist, you know. And, like, thanks. This is the first time anybody's ever been so nice. Because, like, oh, yeah, well, that's fine. We're accepting of whatever religion you are. It's cool. What religion are you? And I was like, you know, I don't know if I have one. I was like, I don't think I have one. But I do also, I don't know, I always say Christian to make my life easier. And, like, still believe, like, some of the Christian mantras, I guess, you know. So I believe long ago some, some dude named Jesus Christ died Probably for my sins, and I was explaining that to these guys. I was like, probably because he's, well, you know, he thought people could be better. But, because, I mean, Jesus Christ did exist. 
Not necessarily yeah, as yeah, yeah. A, a person not, that it. There's not, a, no, a, there's not even a great amount of historical evidence to agree to that. I thought there was enough. There was it's evidence like, that said Jesus Christ actually physically existed as a no, part. There really is not a lot of historical evidence. I mean, considering the time when Jesus Christ was doing all of his stuff, <coughs> there was a number of Roman historians who were there documenting pretty much everything, day to day life. A lot of uh, general things were going on. We know quite a bit about what happened during that time. The earliest time we have reference to the cult of Christianity was about 60. Uh, 60 ADE, or CE, sorry, 60 CE, um, where there's just like a little footnote in some historians, like, there's talk of the cult of Christianity. Because, I mean, all the references to Jesus Christ are all written by people who have a vested interest in this character. But also, of course, the church has, throughout its history, just deleted books, destroyed evidence of destroyed books themselves that disagree with the divinity of Christ or whatever else they don't like. So there's a lot of the you know, stories that don't exist anymore. Gotcha. So that's what's going on with Brexit. And apparently Jesus Christ. And apparently Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. Uh, thousands attend Nipsey Hussle's thousands in attendance at the fa funeral at Staples Center in Los Angeles. The fucking video started playing as I was talking. In life, Nipsey Hussle last took center court at the Staples Center on March 9th to perform during the halftime of a Clippers NBA basketball game. In death, the Grammy-nominated artist filled the marquee Los Angeles Avenue on his own Thursday uh, for his public memorial. <clears throat> Fans of the rapper who was gunned down in front of his Los Angeles South, Los Angeles, South Los Angeles clothing store on March 31st at the age of 33 uh, received free tickets to what was it billed as, quote, Celebration of Life. The service got underway just after 10 a.m., uh, local time with a performance of Hustles' hit song Victory Lap and mourners chanting Nipsey, Nipsey, Nipsey. So that's the thing. Like, uh, <clears throat> and this is like a thing in, I want to say predominantly like black communities and stuff. They definitely, it, it's a celebration of life when you die, which I feel is a pretty good way to do it. Mm -hmm. you ce celebrate their. My funeral for me is just. Celebrate what was and celebrate the you know the living. It's just like the whole the whole quote you know the fucking funerals aren't for the dead they're for the living. Mhm. Mm Enjoy yourselves. <laughs> my my funeral. Everybody go to the speakeasy bar. Woo! I mean it's pretty interesting. Like if you go down to the pictures, you'll see like how many people, you know, showed up for this. Um, yeah, it looks like a. Memorial. Yeah, it looks like fans are so cute. <laughs> Here's a quote. He lived the gang life, but he didn't stay there. He lived the life of the hood, but he rose above the pull of gravity. Which is good. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, da, da, da. Interesting, then a former president, Barack Obama. I was about to read that thing about Barack Obama. Uh, let's see, so yeah, so former President Barack Obama sent a letter that was read by Hustles' friend and business partner Karen Civil. In the letter, Obama said he had never met Hustle, but, quote, heard his music through my daughters and learned of his community work in Los Angeles' Crenshaw District. Quote, after his passing, I had the chance to learn more about his transformation and his community work, Obama wrote. Quote, while most folks look at the Crenshaw neighborhood, where he grew up and only see gangs, bullets, and despair, Nipsey saw potential. He saw hope. He saw a community that, even through its flaws, taught him to always keep going. Uh, quote, he set an example for young people to follow, and his is a legacy worth celebration. The letter continued. I hope his memory inspires more good work in Crenshaw and communities like it. Good, good stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Eh. Uh, Snoop Doggy had something to say about Snoop Monk said he and Hustle had so much in common that when they first met, quote, it was like a magnet coming together. He said the Hustle was a, quote, peace advocate, and he thanked his mother and father for, quote, giving us Nipsey. Good old Snoop Dogg. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, apparently uh, Stevie Wonder was there, and he told the crowd that he had looked forward to watching Hustles' wonderful life unfold, only to have it end too soon. Woof. <clears throat> Quote, it is a heartbreak for uh, to lose a member of our family. It is a heartbreak because it's so unnecessary, the 68-year-old Stevie Wonder said. Quote, we are still living in a time where ego, anger, jealousy is controlling our lives. It's so painful to know that we don't have enough people taking a position that says, listen, we must have stronger gun laws. It's unacceptable. Uh, before singing one of Hustles' favorite songs, Rocket Love, and the Eric Clapton ballad, Tears in Heaven, Wonder recalled how Hustle motivated and inspired people everywhere it went. Quote, I hope that he motivated you enough to say, listen, enough of people getting killed by guns and violence, Wonder said. Nice. <clears throat> and the memorial service was followed by a 25-mile funeral procession. Fuck. To Hustles' final resting place, uh, Forest Lawn Memorial Park. The cortege, cortege was expected to travel through Los Angeles, Crenshaw District, where Hustle grew up and was shot to death in front of his clothing store, the Marathon. Uh, the Marathon. That's interesting. 25 miles, man. Mm-hmm. It's nuts. Well, the Staples Center is in, like, the center of L.A. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, tragic that this uh, community lost somebody who uh, was doing such good for it. Right. Uh, and, you know, the people he inspired and uh, the work he was doing. I mean, it, it sounded like he was doing very fantastic work. I mean, literally, I mean, as I was telling uh, David earlier, is that the day after that uh, he was shot, he was actually supposed to meet with like a bunch of police officials to talk about how they can uh, better uh, the policing and the community outreach between the police and these uh, affected communities. So, I mean, he, he was working across the aisles, across, you know, all the people to try and get them to talk with each other and, you know, make a better, uh, you know, life for them all. I mean, like he talked about uh, how he actually employed people in the Crenshaw district where he grew up and gave, you know, jobs to these people, employ these people. You know, he was actually doing things to help better his community and make it stay that way. And now he's cut down. A life ended far too soon. On a bit of good news, however, the alleged gunman was arrested after a two-day manhunt, and this charge has been charged with one count of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of possession of a firearm by, by a felon in connection with the shooting. Uh, the gunman is being hailed on a $5 million bond and faces up to life in prison if convicted. All right, tragic, just tragic news. But it's good to see the amount of people that came out to celebrate his life, and hopefully they'll be able to take the spirit he uh, inspired and uh, continue in his name making the world a bit better. I'm actually going to skip this. I was going to say I was done covering that, so... Yeah. On to Pompeo. Pompeo. Yep. I had to go. I had to go downstairs and monitor the children that live in my house because apparently they're bad. Apparently. Yes, but I see the head head Pompeo. Could be that father like locks up his alcohol now along with his guns. <laughs> goddamn children getting in my goddamn alcohol. <coughs> anyway. The Pompeo has floundered on why annexation is good for the Golden Heights. Uh, Golden Hills? For Golan. I don't know. No, Golden Heights. That's right. Uh, but not for Crimea. So basically, Oof. what happened was uh, Israel has just uh, annexed a landmass called the Golan Heights, which is territorially owned by uh, Syria. 
and which officially under UN agreements was to be left uh, in Syria's ownership until the time that an agreement could be worked out. Uh, but Trump has stepped in and said, you know what, it's good for Israel. They have the Golan Heights and it should be theirs. Basically putting his foot in it and just saying, no, no, no. I'm God Emperor Trump, and this is Israel. <laughs> I'm, God, I'm God Emperor Trump, and this is Israel. It's beautiful. Pretty much what he did. I mean, he's, I think he said the same thing, because uh, he also has stepped in it by declaring parts of the Iranian, Iranian Revolutionary Guard a terrorist organization, which the State Department did not want, the military did not want, the people within the region, including our allies, did not want, but Israel wanted it, so it happened. And we're friend, good, good, good friends with Israel. Yeah, they we're the best friends. The best friends. But yes, so uh, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo told senators that there was an international law doctrine, which would be explained to them later. It's like, it's like I, don't, I don't know now, but I'll, I'll, I'll get my office. My office will talk to your office. We'll get people, essentially. Uh, but it turns out. To nobody's surprise, there is no doctrine. <laughs> the State Department's clarification of Pompeo's remarks contained not one, not uh, no reference to one, and experts on interna international law says one does not exist. So Trump's decision to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, which it captured from Syria in 1967, took the State Department by surprise. And it's been struggling to catch up ever since. So Pompeo has provided several justifications for the move from ancient Jewish rights to the plateau to the justness of the Israeli cause in the Six Day War and the blunt force of facts on the ground. Because apparently if you just take from somebody and uh, they don't bother to fight back because it causes an international war, it's yours. Interesting. Uh, but on Tuesday, the senators bomb, uh, bombarded by questions uh, by senators' questions on the distinction between the Golan Heights and the Crimea cases, he suggested there was a body of international law underpinning, underpinning Trump's move, which would be revealed. Which, as we said, nothing like that exists. Um, but the State Department did release a statement saying that Israel's administration of the Golan Heights and Russia's occupation and purported annexation of Crimea should not be compared, as the circumstances just simply couldn't be more different. Couldn't be more different. Good. No. It says here that it continues. Israel gained control of the Golan Heights through its legitimate response to Syrian aggression aimed at Israel's destruction. It continued while Russia has occupied Crimea, despite the fact that it recognized Crimea as part of the Ukraine in the bilateral agreements, and despite its international obligations and commitments, including core uh, organization for the security of co cooperation in Europe principles. That's pretty interesting, considering that, uh, you know, they have just taken Crimea under the auspices that there are Russian citizens Native Russians, uh, who are Ukrainian, who are being oppressed. For being oppressed, uh, but... Israel, so just... Yeah, it's kind of like the same uh, move Hitler pulled in Poland, where he was saying basically that there were Jewish, uh, Polish, Jewish, Polish people, or not Jewish, German, Polish. German, Polish citizens. people. There are people and they're being oppressed, so then we, we're going to go ethnically out... Ethnically Germans. Ethnically Germans. Being oppressed. Yeah. So you're like, we're going to go in and defend our people. Russia essentially used the same argument with Crimea. Gotcha. And Israel has just taken the Golan Heights. And now there are some people saying they may just go in and take uh, the Gaza Strip. Yeah. There are some rumors of that. Which the Gaza Strip is currently held by Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization that also does attack Israel routinely and also will not agree to a two-state solution. Hezbollah is bad. <laughs> Hezbollah is bad. <laughs> no, not Hezbollah. Hamas. Sorry, it is Hamas, not Hezbollah. Hezbollah is African. 
Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's Hamas. And Hamas is the, the yeah, it's a terrorist organization. Although Hezbollah is also a terrorist organization. Yes. Did, is Hezbollah one of the, is, is Hezbollah the African one that, uh, is it African? Yes. Is that one that we supported? No, I don't think so. There, there's there's well, definitely think... a terrorist organization that we supported somewhere. I mean, we have. I mean, we've done it before. I mean, we supported them in, in Syria. Right. I mean, technically that's how we got ISIS, because we supported the whatever group of people that eventually turned into ISIS. <laughs> Because, mm-hmm. yeah. It's, a- it's also pretty interesting because in that same State Department statement, it says that the U.S. policy continues to be that no country can change the borders of another by force. So somehow, Israel taking the land during the Sixth Day War with force was not force because it's Israel. It's because it's our ally. Our allies can It's like the whole, the whole thing where, like, yeah, our friends can't be the problem it's everyone no, else no. you're the problem yeah you're the problem oh what, what? no 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 our friends are fantastic people they would never do such a thing mm. yeah. cool I got paid too nice yeah <clears throat> I just have a calendar vote so that <laughs> so I was like yeah or not a calendar vote a calendar notification ugh so to further state how against international law this is, under UN Charter and the UN Security Council Resolution 242, agreed that in the aftermath of the 1970 or 1967 Arab-Israeli War, it stressed the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. And this was an agreement that we agreed upon because state because Security Council resolutions don't happen if we don't agree to them essentially. So, clearly, U.S. policy was, and technically still in the books, is that that land is inadmissible for Israel to take. But uh, when has Trump ever cared about the law, or the rule of law, or international conventions, or just uh, statecraft whatsoever? Yes. <laughs> Interesting to see. The City Department also tweeted out saying that the Trump administration sees the world as it is, <laughs> not as we wish it to be. <laughs> <laughs> Where is this? Is this in the story? Yeah, it's in the story. This is like the State Department actually tweeted this bullshit out. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, at Secretary Pompeo on F, uh, a fiscal year 2020 budget, the at real Donald Trump administration sees the world as it is, not as we wish it would be. Basing policy uh, on reality, we recognize Jerusalem and Israel's capital, Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, and why we designated the IRGC NFTO. The Israeli Revolutionary Guard. Yep. Fucking hell. Trump, in three years, has destroyed decades of U.S. foreign policy. Yep, sounds about right. I mean, no one in their no one in the world in their right mind should trust the United States except for Israel. Apparently, but if any other nation in the world were to see this is happening, because the thing is, like presidents. You know, they do differ in their policies. You know, we have Democrats, Republicans, and everything else. You know? mm-hmm. And people have a way of handling things. But it's generally agreed upon is that if, you know, our policy is one thing and there's no real reason to change it, Can I, we yeah. keep the policy as is unless something, you know, makes it necessary to change it. Because, you know, that's why we keep agreements. That's why we keep, you know, that's why... To take it? Many decades. Yeah, for the many decades that we've had these policies, why we don't recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, is because long-standing agreements. And for Trump to just come in here and be like, "No, no, this, this is all wrong. I'm gonna do things my way." 
uh, international law, international agreements, you know, carefully agreed upon you know, policies. Fuck it. Trash it all. Anyway, that's all I'll cover here. I'm definitely here. I'm just drinking, drinking some, mm -hmm. some, uh, what is it? Uh, cranberry juice? <clears throat> yeah, cranberry juice with a minute amount of vodka. Mm -hmm. I'm also waiting for something to finish cloning. Anyway. <clears throat> So, Vattenfall uh, to test salt-based power storage technology. Uh, salt battery? What? <laughs> Essentially. Oh, Oslo. Mm -hmm. Rooters. Wait, is this in Oslo? Yeah. We have a fucking factory. or uh, I think, yeah, we have a factory there. And also, I support a shit ton of um, engineering guys in Oslo. That's kind of funny. Anyway. So a Swedish LM doesn't support anybody there. <laughs> so, yeah, of course that. A Swedish power producer Vattenfall has co uh, commissioned a plant to test the storage in salt of electricity from solar plants and wind turbines, hoping to overcome the stop-start nature of green energy, which is one of its main disadvantages. Um, Interesting. Yep. Uh, efficient energy storage is vital in increasing the appeal of renewable power. Yes, most definitely, because that's a part of the biggest problem mm -hmm. about renewable energy is like storing it in batteries or hooking it up into your you know power system because it, it it only works when it's working it's not a it's not a you know not a constant thing yeah yeah <clears throat> or like especially for as far as energy storage you know like electric cars the electric car revolution is happening mm -hmm. it is not going to stop I but we so. do need higher density batteries or more efficient technology. Basically, if we can get cars for people like me to the point where, like, I could go from here to Houston, you know, essentially. So the, the biggest problem is charge. The thing is you can. Well, not without stops in between. I can't, well, I could go from here to Houston, yeah. but I can't go from here between, to Bay City. You can't go from here to Bay City nonstop, but you couldn't do that with your car anyways. Uh, yeah. But you can, because I've, I've run the Tesla maps from here to there, because I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. It's like, so from Bay City, you can make it to basically uh, super north Houston, like north of Sugarland, mm -hmm. uh, I mean north of uh, Woodlands, mm -hmm. and stop there, and you can recharge, and it takes about 30 minutes. And then you head up there, and you charge once more in Corsicana, and then I could essentially make it home. Yeah. But the problem is you so have to charge times. those places. But you got to think about it in a, yeah. as a not Tesla, because Tesla has better technology but as a the standard of people or the standard technology that most cars have is not there. Like the charging time it takes you to get mm -hmm. enough charge to go the rest of the way. This so Tesla supercharger is the only thing that can charge it fast. I don't think there's any other like standard consumer charger or anything. I don't think there's any standard like like if you go sometimes there's places with car well, there chargers. There are standards. It's just they vary. Um I think most, a lot of chargers in like the Houston area are level two chargers, mm -hmm. which means they could theoretically charge from a, a full battery in about an hour, hour and a half, I think. Yeah. With Tesla's level three superchargers that just came out, they can charge from zero to 100 in like 30, 45 minutes, a lot faster. It puts out like nearly double the amount of power. But that means it uses double the amount of power. One, two, it also only works for Tesla's proprietary stuff. I don't. I don't think they have. I think it uses Tesla's proprietary connection. That's the other thing. So we have all this stuff coming out, and I think most people are using standards, but Tesla stuff. Tesla has its own specific power cable and system. At least in America, I think they do actually use the European standard. Well, yeah, it's because because Europe's on top of that shit. They're like, we have a standard. Yeah, like, no, 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 standard, bitch. Pretty much. ISO all the way. Which, to be fair, is interesting. Although, it's weird. Uh, it's it's weird that they use 220 volts for everything over there. Well, 220 is... Well, the thing is, 220 is more efficient. Is it more efficient? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. With 120, it is a lot less efficient. And it's a lot more dangerous. Because, hmm. I mean, with 220, you know, you're, you're moving twice the, twice the volts. About. But you can use thinner cables that are safer 
you know, because like here to move 120, it takes very thick cables in comparison. Right, what are you talking? Are you talking about for so so? This is this is the difference as as far as power goes. Is you're talking about volts. Volts isn't isn't the big deal as far as like electrocution and stuff and safety. It's amperage. It's how mu how much can you continue to put out that volt that voltage or wattage at as a sustained um, sustained draw or sustained whatever power. Well, the thing is, I mean, with two twenty, you know, you can amperage is like what volts times watts. No, you can change amperage. Well, yeah, but is is amperage volt times watch? I don't know. Let's go. We're going back to math as we routinely do. We double check calculations and find fucking physics number. It's like the fifth time we've used a physics calculation because I believe electricity is mm -hmm. a physics. How many amps will kill you? That's not the true thing. Oh, uh, amps. That's the amperage. Yeah. Yeah, amps, watts, volts, and ohms. How stuff works. Well, ohms is resistance, which your body has. I forget what the body's resistance is. I don't know. We're all over here trying to figure shit out. And I'm not finding the calculation for amperage. Um, strength of an electrical current measured in amperes. Yeah, so it's the current versus the voltage <coughs> I know that the the amps matter more than the volts itself okay so here's the thing no volts is the total number of men amperage the output of each man and it equals the watts which is the total output so wattage is a equation of volts times amps mm -hmm. so that's the when it's high wattage that means it's high on both and will probably kill you uh, the interesting. Watch volt circuits, amps, amperage, APMs, amps per minute. Yeah, amps. Anyways, we're we're fucking miles off topic. Let's get back to the story. We'll talk about this. Yeah, try to try to figure this shit out. Just like this, these exist. Anyway, <clears throat> I love how they're called Saltex. Uh. Efficient energy stores, vital increase renewable power. A Vattenfall's pilot program will use the technique developed by another Swedish firm, SaltX Technology. SaltX's system uses salt crystals coated in a nanomaterial, which can be heated up with electricity, then release the heat when they are discharged. So, like a battery. Interesting. Uh, Vattenfall's pilot project, set to run at the end of this, uh, to the end of summer, will be located at the Ruder Thermal Power Plant in Berlin. And will have a storage capacity of 10 megawatts, the company said on Thursday, noting that this would be the first time Saltex's technology is tested on an industrial scale. 10 megawatts. I mean, 10 megawatts isn't. It's it's. Oh, it's not a lot. I don't. Uh, hmm. As far as, far as storage goes, yeah, storing 10 megawatts is pretty pretty high. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of stuff that could store that much. At least, like, in a single-scale battery thing. Like, that uh, 10 megawatts worth of storage would require a very large uh, well, Let's see, a single megawatt can power a thousand homes. So, 10 megawatts is a fuck ton of power. Yeah. So, I guess that is pretty big. But, as far as in an industrial use case, that's not a lot of power. <laughs> Maybe that's a decent amount of power. Yeah. It depends on what you're powering. Because this is talking about storing power from solar and wind. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you get enough of these together. Because, like I said, one megawatt powers a thousand homes. So a battery for 10 megawatts powers 10,000 homes. Oh, that's power. right, because a megawatt's bigger than a kilowatt by 10, I believe. Or a thousand or whatever it is. A thousand. Yeah, it's a thousand. Because kilowatt is a megawatt. It's all in base 10. It's all, yeah, it's all in base 10, but it's like how many of 10? Yeah. Yep. So that is a significant amount of power. Uh, let's see. 
Project manager Marcus Witt said the firm will collect data to assess whether uh, to assess whether and how this type of plant can be used in business. Quote, some questions are now uh, how, how large amounts of salt can be used, how quickly the storage medium reacts, and how the process can be controlled, which, uh, yeah, which is all, you know, uh, effective question. Salt Texas technology enables this, quote, salt battery to be charged several thousand times and the energy stored for weeks or months without losses, Vattenfall said. Really? Now that's, that's 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 where it comes in. That's interesting because that's the thing. You need you need to be able to be charged a shit ton because you have to charge and discharge these. But the thing is, the biggest I guess problem with batteries is the storage and how much it you know how fast it and loses. Also the dangerousness to store. Well, that's the thing. I mean, all of this all of this stuff is just like. Currently, how batteries work, you know, even in, like, your car or whatever, it's just a sh they're all in, in a giant series, essentially. They're all, it's essentially, they're all wired up to be one giant pack, so... Yeah, but I mean, it's also pretty interesting that this battery can store power for months. Without no loss. loss. Yeah, that's the big deal there. That's huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are essentially super capacitors. Yeah. That are safe. Well, I mean... They're still holding a shit ton of power. <laughs> when, when, you're messing, really when, when you're messing with that much power, <laughs> safety's kind of like a... Mm. <laughs> Safety's still a concern. It's, it's safe. Maximizing safety. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's funny. Safety is kind of there, but it's just like... Is there even really a safe when you're handling thousands of power? You better hope there is. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, continuing on... Uh, the crashed uh, Japanese 35 F-35 wreckage has been found in the Pacific. So, earlier this week, an F-35A F uh, that was flying out of Misawa, Japan, uh, had crashed in the Pacific. And they had found, they finally found the wreckage, but they have not yet found the pilot. The aircraft, less than a year old, uh, was the first F-35 assembled in Japan. Interesting, I didn't know they assembled in Japan. <laughs> and was aloft for only 28 minutes on Tuesday before contact was lost. The plane had logged a total of 280 hours in the air. Oh. It was the only... It was the... It was only the second F-35 to crash since the aircraft's first flight in 2006. And could reignite concerns that the F-35 only had one engine. <laughs> I don't know if it matters if, if these concerns happen, because it's still only going to have one engine. I don't think there's a way they could retrofit it to have two. Unless they use two smaller ones, but I think, I believe that would require an entire fucking aircraft an redesign. Entire redesign. Yeah. And then it would be many more hundreds of billions of dollars right? behind. Right. Oh no, it only has one engine. Yeah, some of the modern fighters have two. In fact, the F-22 Raptor, I think, has dual. <laughs> this, this is still my favorite. <laughs> so the cause is unknown. The advanced single-seat jet disappeared in good weather, about 135 kilometers or 84 miles. In good weather? Sour. Yeah, in good weather. Like, this wow. is why it's a huge mystery. Because, like, it was good weather... Time. It doesn't matter. Lockheed Martin developed the F-22, so it's all good. <laughs> uh, yeah, twin engine, all-weather stealth tactical fighter aircraft. So yeah, that it is a twin engine. That's what I thought. That's probably why it's superior. And it was a good thing they were able to recover the wreckage, because basically it was a race against time for that. How long how does, uh, How long until they recovered the wreckage versus the time that it went missing? Uh, about, I think it was about two or three days. Really? That's surprising, because they said it lost communication with it in, like, 30 minutes. I'm surprised they didn't kind of... Yeah. Well, the ocean's a big place. <clears throat> I, I, yeah, I suppose it's true, but, I mean, whenever you, you know... <laughs> I yeah. don't know. It does take a while. Yeah, but I know, I know it was, there was huge speculation, because, basically, Japan or the United States had to find it before China or Russia. Oh, yeah, that's a big deal. Because if China got a hold of it then they pretty much would have recreated the F-35 perfectly, because China does damn good work copying shit. <laughs> and Russia just would have found out a lot of secrets about it and probably not have been good. <laughs> not have been good. I mean, 
effectively, they already can. I'm sure if China really wants them, they can purchase one in it, like... No, they can't. <coughs> indirectly, they can't. Keep... No, they can't. We keep... They're, they're, the tracking on who gets an F-35 and where they go is pretty tight. Gotcha. Um, and also, like, if anybody, if any country tried to sell these to China or Russia, uh, they would probably get sued to all hell. And there would be huge sanctions. It would probably destroy an economy. Interesting. That's good. These are the fifth generation, the only fifth generation stealth fighters. Yeah. So those cannot get into, into uh, quote unquote, enemy hands. Right. But, uh, yeah. So the uh, crashed aircraft... Let's see, did it, uh, so it says here that the aircraft was leading three F-35s on training maneuvers when it, set, when it sent an aborting practice signal and disappeared from radar. Oh. That's really strange. The pilot, who had 3,200 hours of flying time but only 60 hours in an F-35, gave no, under, no, no other indication he was in trouble. The crashed aircraft was the fifth to be delivered to the Autonomous Safety Defense Force? What the hell Japan's military is? Uh, wait, which one? Hold on, let me see. Get down here. But it was the first to be assembled oh. by... Oh, <clears throat> ASDF, that's, that's going to be the... So the SDF is Self-Defense Force, and so the A, I'm assuming, is going to be the Air Self-Defense Force. I guess. Did they say autonomous something or another? No, I just assumed. So. No, it's it's FDS, the Self Defense Force. That's their army mm -hmm. and their military stuff. The SDF. It's interesting that this plane was was assembled by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in Japan. Well, also leave it to a. Week. Is there anything that like Mitsubishi doesn't do there? <clears throat> I don't know. Mitsubishi cars aren't even are they sold still? Huh. Mitsubishi's dead as a car company, but huh. that was like one branch. Like you know how Samsung has Samsung Heavy Industry. Do they have Samsung, Samsung Heavy Industry? I didn't know it was. I know yeah, Samsung's yeah. alive and well in every aspect of existence, but they're Chinese. They're not Japanese. No, yeah, no Samsung. Is, well, Samsung is Korean. Is it? Oh yeah, it's Korean. Mitsubishi. It's Korean. That's right. Yeah. Mitsubishi is Japanese. I would assume it would be like Sony Heavy Industries at this point. That would be interesting. <laughs> Not just a bunch of Nintendo Heavy Industries. Right? Uh, no! <laughs> Nintendo <laughs> Heavy Industries. Oh, God. Uh, but right now, Japan's 12 remaining F-35s are grounded. Which is interesting, because they only went into, like, operational conditions. Like, last month. Uh, like, last month, they got the all clear saying, these are good to go real. Apparently, Mitsubishi Motors still exists, and they still produce cars. Hmm. Their stock price is like uh, OTC markets. What is that? Out of the whatever markets, anyway. It's low as shit. Their stock price is like $5 a piece. But yeah, they still exist. Hmm. Their headquarters in Minato, Tokyo, Japan. Interesting. Yep. Um, but yeah, so South Korea is not grounding any of its planes, nor is the Pentagon. No. No other countries are. <laughs> going to ground. Parent organization Mitsubishi Group and Renault Nissan Mitsubishi Alliance. What? I didn't know they had a fucking uh, alliance, like basically a, a group. So Mitsubishi t t parent organization. Wow. Mitsubishi owns Nissan, I guess? And Renault? And also people search for Renault and Dacia. Holy what? They make the Dacias? Nah, that's not what. So apparently, that the plane that just crashed cost one hundred and twenty-six million dollars. One hundred and twenty-six. Oh yeah. To put it in perspective, that's about thirty million dollars more than if it was built here in America. Mm, gotcha. So uh, yeah, build a build American. Wow. So they also keep me employed. So they have. Uh, an alliance group with Renault, which is the French multinational automobile manufacturer who makes the Dossiers, which are the things that go into Russia, a lot of Russian cars. That's that's actually interesting to notice that there's like two Japanese automakers in a fucking alliance, like, 
in basically a trading group with a French multinational company. Yeah, that's just just interesting to me. Man, dude, parent when you go deep into parent organizations and shit, it you know, just it goes, it goes yeah. And there's there's their parent uh their what is it? Their founding uh their founder, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries L T D. Yeah, Mitsubishi mm-hmm. Heavy Industries Limited. Multinational Engineering Equipment Electronics Company headquartered in Tokyo. Yep. And uh, that's worth a lot more. Their revenue is 4.11111 trillion Japanese New Yen. Interesting. And he's on to science! Science! First ever black hole image is released. I'm not even going to show the picture because at this point, if you haven't seen the black hole images, I don't know where the fuck you've been. It's a fucking meme. What rock have you been hiding on? Right. <sighs> so anyway, astronomers have taken the first ever image of a black hole, which is located in a distant galaxy. It measures 40 billion kilometers across, 3 million times the size of Earth, and has been described by scientists, uh, quote, as a monster. The black hole is 500 million trillion kilometers away. Million trillion, that's funny. Kilometers <laughs> away, and was photographed by a network of eight telescopes across the world. Details have been published today in Astrophysical Journal Letters. Uh, it was captured by the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, a network of eight linked telescopes. Uh, Professor Heino Falkel, uh, or Fal- Falke, I don't know, of Radba- uh, yeah, Radbo- Radboud, Radboud University in the Netherlands, who proposed the experiment, told BBC News that the black hole was found in a galaxy called M87. Quote, what we see is larger than the uh, the size of our entire solar system. End quote. He said, wow, fuck. It has a mass, uh, quote, it has a mass 6.5 billion times out of the sun and is one of the heaviest black holes that we think exists. It's an absolute monster, the heavyweight champion of black holes in the universe. End quote. Wow. Well, is, uh, where, is this like, is this the black hole at the center of the galaxy? It's eating everything or is that a different one? This is this is a different one. The other one isn't as photogenic, <coughs> right? Uh, so anyway, but it's also pretty interesting to see is that like it's also it's also sending out like five thousand like uh, light years long streams of energy from both sides. Hmm. It's crazy. So the image shows an intensely bright ring of fire, as Professor Falk describes it, surrounding a perfectly circular dark hole. Uh, the bright halo is caused by superheated gas falling into the hole. The light is brighter than all the billions of other stars in the galaxy combined, which is why it can be seen at such a uh, distance from Earth. The edge of the dark circle at the center is the point at which the gas enters the black hole, which is an object that has such a large gravitational pull not even light can escape. And there's actually a photo here. Astronomers have suspected the M87 galaxy has a supermassive black hole. It's hard from false color images such as this one. The dark center is not a black hole, but indicates the stars are densely packed and fast moving. Interesting. So you see that like blue stream off to the right? <laughs> yeah, that's coming out of the center of that. Yep. That's that's that matter stream at 5,000 light years long stream of matter. Interesting. Uh, man. So uh, let's see. Uh, the image matches the theoretical physics uh, physicist and indeed Hollywood directors imagine black holes would look like. According to Dr. Ziri Yunsi of uh, University College of London, who is part of the EHT collaboration. Quote, although they are relatively simple objects, black holes raise some of the most complex questions about the nature of space and time, and ultimately of our existence, end quote, he said. Uh, quote, it is remarkable that the image we observe is so similar to that which we obtain from our theoretical calculations. Uh, so far, it looks like Einstein is correct once again, end quote. But having the first image will enable researchers to learn more about these mysterious objects. They will be keen to look out for ways in which black hole departs from what's expected in physics. No one really knows how bright the ring around the hole is created. Even more intriguing is the question of what happens when an object falls into a black hole. Yeah, because there's it, all these theories. Until we watch it, we don't know, technically. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we have ideas. I mean, it's super massive, and it pulls anything, and it obviously distorts fucking light. So, you know, eh? Theoretically. It pulls in even mm, light. Time dilation. The thing is that the image that we're seeing of this black hole was from 50 million years ago. Right. 
At least, that's the, at least that's in that mean. section of the solar system, you know, or in the galaxy. Yeah, in the galaxy. Yeah. So who knows that's how big it is currently, or what it's actually doing in realistic in it, basically in local time. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the crazy thing about space travel and space, time is that everything we're looking at is far in the past. When when the first rays of light were projecting off of it. Humanity didn't exist. Right. And the dinosaur, the dinosaurs are still roaming the earth, probably, I think. Fuck, I don't know. But yeah, and eventually, whenever our measly planet comes to be one of those lights that just gets snuffed out of existence. Shit. <laughs> uh, I wonder if anybody in any other planet will look at something like our area of the world and be like, this is cool too. <laughs> this is neat! <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be, we'll be long dead before anything really happens in this world. Like at least me and you. I mean, maybe humanity as a species won't be. I don't or have the I, best faith. We'll get out there and colonize space. I know. I, I just don't believe in ourselves too much because it, it, we have to somehow collectively pull our heads out of our asses, and that's just that's something above It'll us. Be at hard, this point. But I, I think I think America. I think, <laughs> I think America. <laughs> I think America can do it. I think I think America can pull its head out of its ass. What causes a beer belly? You know, I feel like they took this beer belly picture and they used the dude from fucking uh, uh, Randy from fucking Trailer Park Boys. Is... Anyway, that's funny. Yeah, there you go. Information yeah, about Michael I mean, that's been a meme. Picture about the black. Yeah. Oh, no. PewDiePie! I got some PewDiePie no! news. Where a New Delhi High Court has ordered YouTube to take down certain PewDiePie videos over racist and derogatory comments towards India and T series. That's funny. Man, they're really defending T series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a petition has been filed against this channel in the Delhi High Court demanding that said video be deleted from YouTube. And in a verdict passed on April 8th, the, the Delhi High Court has directed YouTube to expunge the defamatory videos and ensure that the same are not re-uploaded. Well, you know what you've just done, New Delhi High, or Delhi High Court? Uh, it will get re-uploaded to every platform in existence about three trillion times. All right. Looking at you, Pornhub. The ruling comes after T-Series filed a legal complaint contending that in an attempt to surpass T-Series as the top channel on YouTube, PewDiePie has been uploading defamatory and disparaging music videos which target not just T-Series, but Indians as a community. Further, the complaint also states the videos contain racist, inflammatory, and hateful remarks against Indians. <laughs> ah, T-Series, go fuck yourself. You may have won the battle. You've not won the war. So wait, did 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 T series finally become better than Pewds? I mean, I think they won for a bit for like a couple of days, which was the longest that they had won. I don't know whether they're still currently winning because PewDiePie took over. Uh, let me see if there is a subscriber difference. Yeah, so PewDiePie is back on top with a two hundred thousand subscriber difference. Oh yeah, that's a large. Remember, folks. Subscribe to PewDiePie. I'm not going to agree to that, but, you know. Go subscribe to PewDiePie. I won't even subscribe to him. I won't subscribe to either of them. I, I had to, like, what, contemplate subscribing to T-Series just because I'm definitely anti If you anti subscribe Felix. to T-Series, unsubscribe to T-Series and get better taste in music. Right. So, but I, I'll just <coughs> do the thing that I always do and just pick neither. And it's just, like, my right to vote. I'll just abstain, like usual. Because I wouldn't vote for either of these guys, so there you go. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't ring that bell for either of these fuckers or anything. Here I am, the so, logical uh, human being, doing my part to make sure the internet stays a shitty place. Because I mean, even if you pick one way or the other, it's not going to change anything. It's just a stupid internet flame war with basically it gets nets both of them solid PR. So I mean, whatever. Shit. The thing is, that's the thing. Is like. T-Series themselves isn't... I don't think they're really advertising, necessarily. Now they are. 
but they weren't previously <coughs> before this all started. It's just that more Indians are getting online, and Indians know T-Series, and T-Series uploads about 10 to 15 freaking videos a day. That's actually pretty like, high. It's a, That's pretty hardcore. They have a whole... It's a whole company, though. Well, it's a huge company. It's like a multi-billion dollar company. They're the biggest music company that also makes movies, and they're a huge Bollywood thing in all of India. They're the biggest. Gotcha. Yeah, well, I mean, that makes sense. Music company is T-Series. That's cool. So, That's interesting. Yeah, I was actually... We would go to Indian places and, like, watch the Indian TV. I was like, yo, have you, has Indian fucking music videos always been over the top? Or did, like... Is that something they took from Americans? And he's like, no, dude. That stuff's been like that forever. And he's like, you, I mean, he's like, you guys... have seen Bollywood movies. You guys have taken that. Yeah, I've seen Bollywood movies. But I mean, like... I'm talking about their music videos. Have you have, have you, you seen their music video? Uh, Bahama Bali or whatever? The fucking... Yeah. We do need to watch that live, because that's great. That will be that great. We still need to all watch that, because it's good. Yeah, anyway. But, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. I expect... If YouTube does anything... They will probably just, like, block the videos in India, but still let it be fine out for the rest of the world. I imagine that's probably all they'll do. That'd be funny. Alright. Mm. <clears throat> do I have this here twice? The Carla Hayden thing? Okay. Yeah, I do have this twice. Alrighty. <clears throat> Carl Hayden has an audacious plan to make Library of Congress available to you online. Oh, man. Ambitious doesn't begin to describe Carl Hayden's plan to make the Library of Congress's collection available to the world. Audacious might be closer to it. Uh, I mean, considering that the Library of Congress is the biggest library in the world. <clears throat> is it actually? Yes. Well, so Hayden, the 14th person to steward the library, wants to, quote, throw open the treasure chest, end quote, by digitizing its vast collection, making it accessible online. The five-year plan's uh, understated wow. name. In five... Does she mean to do it in five years? Or is that just, like, the starting point? Uh, the five-year plan's understated name, enriching the library experience, doesn't capture its scope. It's got scope creep! Anyway... <laughs> Hayden wants... <laughs> oh no, Project Creep. No. Oh no. Maybe that's where all the TIPMs went because they just fired a, sh like, a lot of people. <laughs> so Hayden wants people engaged with everything from letters of Abraham Lincoln to early editions of Batman comics. Well, I didn't know they had that shit there. What? It's the Library of Congress. They pretty much... Like if it gets printed, they pretty much take a, get a copy of it. So that's cool uh, if they do get this all in line. It's going to be... Ugh, so I mean, much really worths of data, but this is the, this is the this is the future. They do need to digitize it all, and I'm okay yeah. with this. And also, considering that a lot of these works they have are very old, so if they don't digitize them, you know, like what happened in Brazil, where the Brazil National Museum got burned down. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the Library of Congress would get burned down, but the documents are old, French. Yes. Also, I think so. Some docs, like, if they basically see air at this point, they'll just become, like, over time they're becoming unlegible because just the degradation of I mean, material. So it says here, the shelving alone runs 826 miles. Wow. That it stores some 170, mil 170 million items, including, 70, uh, including 68. 68 million manuscripts, 6.5 million pieces of music, and more than 3.4 million recordings. Oof, that's, that's, massive. that's massive. So Hayden is both the first woman and the first African-American to oversee the institution. She's also one of just three librarians of Congress to have a professional background in the field of library sciences. That's a thing. Interesting. Other people to hold the post have been scholars, historians, lawyers, and authors. Interesting. She began her career as a children's librarian in 1970 at a Chicago public library. She also served as the head of the American Library Association and executive director of Baltimore's Enoch Pratt, uh, Pratt Free Library. She was appointed as the Librarian of Congress in 2016 by President Barack Obama. Uh, CNET sat down with Hayden, which is, I guess, is where we're getting this article, which is actually interesting to see an article out of CNET since we don't mm -hmm. usually cover things from them or even have them. CNET, for me, was like... This sketchy place to download shit from for forever. So anyway, uh, still is sometimes, right? 
Uh, anyway, sat down with Hayden just ahead of the National Library Week to discuss the Library of Congress's digitization efforts and the roles of libraries in the digital age. Below is an edited and condensed transcript of the conversation. Eh, it's about three minutes. Yeah, we won't get yeah, we're so let me see. Let's see. Uh, tell me about the fire plans. Here we go. We're throwing open the treasure chest, uh, as we like to say, because this is the world's largest library with so many unique items. We want to make these things accessible to people who could never come in person. So they can see the, our manuscripts division and see Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence with footnotes or little side notes uh, with ben, BF for Benjamin Franklin or JA for John Adams. That's pretty cool. I, I, that is pretty I, cool. I, I, yeah, I have to agree with that. That's pretty cool. Uh, so where are they to begin the digitization process? So the library has been digitization, uh, digitizing its special collections for over 20 years. Okay. And we have made quite a bit of progress. Makes sense. For instance, in the past year, we've digitized more than 7.1 million items. Most of the things we're putting online now have never been able to be digitized before. We've recently been putting up the collection of the baseball scout branch, Ricky, who wrote scouting reports for the Ernie Banks and Henry Hank Aaron. Wow. Uh, when you put these things on, you are really expanding the reach. And so this is going to be continuing, uh, be a continuing effort because history never stops. And we are continually getting special collections. We just purchased the collection of the com uh, composer Billy Strayhorn, who was a partner with Duke Ellington, you know, oh, the wow. tick... To take the A train and all that. And we're digitizing the Rosa Parks collection. Nice. That's pretty interesting. But I mean, at 7 million items a year, I mean, it will take them quite a long time to digitize. Yeah, them. and so there's a part of this is how do you decide what to prioritize? Uh, we're con concentrating on the unique items that the library has, like the Diary of Teddy Roosevelt, which shows on February 14th that uh, he put a big X. Because his mother and his wife died in the same house on the same day, and he said oh, that wow. he said uh, in that entry, "My life is finished." Wow. I mean, damn. People with diaries, dude. Nobody keeps a diary anymore. I don't. I haven't. I tried doing the diary thing forever ago. I'm just too lazy to keep a diary. Mm -hmm. Captain's log. No. <laughs> Brennigan's log. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, so let's That's see. A... By the people's crowdsourcing. Tell me about the library's by the people crowdsourcing effort. So let's see. Quite a few institutions, like the National Archives, that have historic documents are using crowdsourcing to allow people to help with the transcriptions of historic documents that are often in very elaborate cursive writing. The Library of Congress is joining this effort. We started with the letters of Abraham Lincoln. We have some 28,000 wow. letters that were written in, to Lincoln during his presidency that haven't been really seen or read widely. Want to get people involved with history, and they're helping bring history to life. Interesting. I mean, this is this is exciting <clears throat> stuff. Uh, I mean, well, well, look at this. So <coughs> the library adds about twelve thousand items to its collection every day. <sighs> so so they're at, they're even games. adding digital stuff, which is interesting. Yeah, but I mean, just to think about how. How uh, huge, how Herculean their task is, is that in a given year they will get over four million items, and at their current scanning rate, they get in, they scan seven million items. So they're barely keeping so, it. They're keeping it by three million. That's still pretty good. Keeping it up by three million, but if they don't massively increase their ability to scan and catalog and everything else that goes into this process. They will never fully scan this thing for decades. Uh, apparently, Captain, this lady talks about something. Uh, she talks about Captain Underpants. So they asked a question, <laughs> you know, since everything has gone digitally, you need paper books anymore. Uh, and she says, Captain Underpants is quite a perennial bestseller. There's an, still an appreciation for material in printed formats. For instance, graphic novels are doing quite well with teenagers. Woo! Weebs! And people simply like having choices. You may take a paperback and you go to the beach because you don't want to take your electric device. But electronic readers may be better when you're traveling on an airplane. And so we're living in a great age in terms of being able to pick your formula too. I'm still personally the, of the people that like to physically hold a book and turn real pages. And, like, I love staring at screens, don't get me wrong, but I feel like I absorb less information as far as book-wise from staring at a screen because I'm used to, like, reading, I don't know, I guess I would say good information or, like, 
you know, important information from a screen, I take that stuff down. You know, whereas if I'm reading a book, I know that it's not, usually since I read fiction, I know it's not, like, something important to fully commit, but I can, I don't know, like, I don't fully commit things that I read online to memory, because a lot of it's just trash info. But, like, a book, Only a book I remember. is being taken up by the book during the process yes where, whereas like i'm time. here on the computer and like in all of my multiple monitors you know focusing on plenty of things at once ah anyway but that's yeah. enough about this this is a good yeah, effort and i agree and this is it'll take probably forever you know it's just a it's one of those things will be an ongoing effort for eternity essentially but mm -hmm. i believe it needs to be done because digitization of these old documents and stuff is very important as we saw, said I like it. Even like so, at at the current rate, they could theoretically have everything scanned in about fifty years. Give or take. Nice. You know, if they really wanted everything scanned, they could bring in a company that does specifically document scanning and like bring in actual document scanners and so all sorts of stuff. I mean, there's there's definitely tech there. I know because we went through a digitization of our entire HR and, like, fucking accounting department so many years ago. They brought in one extra person and then, like, bought a bunch of document scanners. I don't know. It was just... It was an interesting... It was a part of the... Is it either HIPAA compliance or one of the one of the compliances for dealing with credit card information? All right. I'm too stupid and crazy. We've got, quick, we've got two quick stories here. Somebody, I like the police cruisers Somebody is, is stealing wheels off police cruisers in Mississippi. That's the funniest thing and, ever. First off, it's Mississippi. So, uh, yeah, everything gets stolen there. So how is it's it? the worst state in the Union. Is that how Mississippi actually works? I don't know. I assume so because it is the worst state in the Union. It is 50 out of 50 on every goddamn chart. You know, ranking the states. They are consistently the worst on everything. But for the second time in several weeks, thieves have stolen the wheels off Jackson po Jackson Police Department cars. It says uh, it, it is, this this thing says that it's number forty nine in overall rankings on everything. Uh, just about that's an overall ranking. It's got fifty in healthcare, forty six in education. The forty sixth, forty eighth in economy, forty ninth opportunity, forty ninth infrastructure, eight. Number 18th in crime and corrections, uh, 45th mm. in in fiscal civility. Number six in quality of life, though. <laughs> what? Because <clears throat> oh, because that means it's got a lot of natural environment. It's number nine in natural environment, number 15 in social environment. So its quality of life is high. Interesting. It's got a high voter participation rate of 54.2%. Mm, that is pretty uh, and water quality yeah. per thousand residents is almost 1.0, or that's bad actually. It's 0.94, and uh, water quality violations. What is this? At national average is 2.4. Oh, I guess that means water quality violations has only been 0.94 per thousand residents. Nice. Average days with unhealthy air quality zero. Wow. Quality of life there is okay. Right. Yeah, but I'm still going to get that shirt that says, at least we're not Mississippi. Who? So hold on. The overall ranking, who is the actual, the the one in this? The number 50. This is in the U.S. News study yeah, or something. They rank fucking everything. Yep. <clears throat> so something is drastically lower. Uh, but no, no change in rank from 2017 as being the 49th overall. Who is, I want to know who's the 50th. I want to know. It doesn't. Where's the actual rank that shows me who is the literal worst in this rank? Best states. Oh, can I find it by, like, going back through here? Best states. All right, yeah, let's see if I can load it. Uh, yes. See full rankings list. Yeet. Expand list. Yeet. The worst is Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. Yep. Wow. Well. Let's see, according to, let's see. The best America's is Iowa. The worst states to live in in 2018. 
So let's see, what is the worst state? So the worst state to live in is Arkansas, with actually Louisiana rounding at number two. For what? In, in which Arkansas. list is this? Uh, CNBC. Okay, yes. So Arkansas is the worst state because apparently they, the state does not provide protection against discrimination based on race, sex, religion, national origin. It also lacks protections based on sexual orientation, gender identity, marital status, age. And it is one of only three states that bars localities from enacting wider protections of their own. Wow. So basically the state's like, no, 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 cities, fuck you. We're not allowing you to protect your people. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, according to the CDC, it also says that more than 16% of Arkansas's citizens uh, reported frequent mental distress, <laughs> which is the second highest rate in the nation. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny. So this is actually, so they dropped in rank because they were fourth in rank, uh, fourth worst in 2017, uh, with their weaknesses including lack of inclusiveness, uh, poor health and high crime, but their strength being air quality. Uh, Louisiana also suffers from high crime and pollution, plus a fair amount of economic anxiety, uh, scoring the just one out of 25 on Gallup's 2017 Economic Confidence Index. Dude, Mississippi state flag is like the most redneck shit. I didn't even. I forgot that each state has their own flag until I looked at this. I knew California is the bear thing. I knew. Uh, oh wow, Colorado's is that the weird sea thing? Okay, yeah, I, I knew that one. I didn't know Florida's. I didn't know Hawaii. Wow, Hawaii's is British. What? I didn't know that. It's interesting. I knew Texas obviously because we live here, but like, mm-hmm. fucking Mississippi state flag is the most redneck shit, and it's beautiful. I also knew New Mexico's, actually. I mean, I know California's. Uh, everybody, we all know California's stupid fucking flag. The New California Republic! Oh, god damn it. But yeah, yeah, just just take a gander at Mississippi state flag. It's, yeah. Tell me it's beautiful. And then look at Hawaii's state flag after that and go, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Anyways, so yeah, that was that quick story there. Same, they're stealing some wheels. That's just, that's funny. <clears throat> the next story is <coughs> deputies surround burglar in Oregon home to find out the suspect was a Roomba. <laughs> so deputies responding to a 911 call for a burglary in progress at an Oregon woman's home ended up catching the culprit, the Roomba, trapped in the bathroom. The initial call came in from somebody reporting that a stranger was in her bathroom and that the person had locked the bathroom door. She said she could see moving shadows under the door. Within minutes, several deputies surrounded the home, calling for a canine team as backup. They said they could hear a rustling noise coming from the bathroom. After calling to the suspect for several times over a loudspeaker, deputies went into the home with their guns drawn. drawn. After opening the bathroom door, deputies say they found the Roomba crashing around on the floor. Quote... As we, here's a quote here. As we entered the home, we heard rustling in the bathroom. We made several announcements and the rustling became more frequent. <laughs> we breached the bathroom door and encountered a very thorough vacuum, vacuuming done, being done, a vacuum job, being done by a Roomba. Says of Washington County Sheriff's Deputy Rogers wrote in his report. There's no word whether deputies filed charges in the incident, but the uh, suspect's record. To be clean. God damn it. <laughs> See, even better is they fucking they, they memed it themselves and put it on their uh, is mm-hmm. it Twitter or is it Facebook? It looks like Facebook. Probably. Yeah, that's Facebook. Yeah, it's got a Facebook logo up there. Yeah, put it on their Facebook page. Goddamn Roombas always locking doors. Is that a thing? It is. Like, no. how the fuck did it get locked in a bathroom? That's an excellent question. I imagine, like, somebody probably, like, Ac- locked the door. Accidentally, the like, left the door. So I, I've and seen that. came by and, like, closed the door. Yeah, I've seen that, like, I've seen things uh, where you, oh, well, we got a freaking follower from First somewhere. Time. 
Your son, Barrett. I don't know. Anyway, eh, and I've seen that, you know, like, and it's happened to me before, like, the bathroom's been locked and nobody's been in it because I guess over time on top of that with our locks, like, over time as you open and shut the door or somebody, like, turns it slightly, it could close mm -hmm. and just lock it. So, I don't know. Just weird shit happens. Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. It's just kind of funny that it happened to a Roomba and fucking <laughs> the Roomba was just in there making noise. Because, I mean, to be fair, it's just like, what? <laughs> Right, nobody could like, with, like nobody could look under the door, like just see anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, or even hear it, because I mean, the Roombas, I mean, those vacuum cleaners are not always entirely quiet. <coughs> I guess Roombas are pretty quiet. I've heard they're like they're they're quieter than some, but not super. Mm -hmm. I don't. Know. But uh, yeah, that 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 covers it for uh, Tip Not Thirsty episode ninety two. So please join us again next week because we can continue covering news in the world. Uh, you can check out this channel on Thursdays at 9 p.m. for this show, and that's about it. Yep, and that's about it. Thank you also for following there on uh, Mixer. Have, have we, uh, has Mixer chat just not been going off? No, this dude just followed on Mixer. We didn't have any anything going on on Mixer. I mean, hey, all right, you know, whatever, however. Thanks for tuning in, man. But uh, now we're hopping off, so have a good night. Uh, is that the outro? I don't think that was the outro I just hit. There we go. Yeah. That was the outro. I, I hit yeah, the intro. I hit, I hit the old yeah. intro. Now we're leaving. There, there we go. We're going going to bed. Yeah, good night, everybody. And uh, we'll catch you on the next stream, which is, uh, as I said, we're going to start, I guess, doing it. We said 9, right? Yeah. 9 p.m. on Thursdays. Yeah. I was almost late, and I was like, oh, yeah, we do it at 9 instead of 8.30 now, so it's all good. <laughs>